Uh, I don't know if they're running it on the board, they were. Oh, but uh, I forgot to start a PowerPoint yesterday. And everything that I, that's on that PowerPoint, all it is is, is advice people gave us over the years uh, that we thought was just so relevant, so we put it up there. And um, so I guess just to give a quick summary, I guess, uh, I guess this is how we're going to do this, is we're going to kind of tell you, I guess, our story, in a sense, uh, which you heard a lot of it yesterday, but just Mary and I. And then my best friend, since I was 13, Matt, he was the other one. And then Jacob uh, was, Jacob Gibson uh, was uh, the fourth one we brought on after about uh, nine months, eight months. He was the teacher who ended up selling. The four of us owned the company. Um, Mary, just to, just to, how do we set things out, how it worked, Mary, I was a, an assistant principal and Mary, was a, a realtor who also uh, then became owner right pretty, pretty close to after that of a brokerage, uh, one of the largest brokerages in uh, Roanoke, uh, uh, largest um, independently, independently owned. owned. And then Mary also became the state president for the uh, Realtors Association in the middle of all this. And now she's the, on the national level, a regional vice president over five states on top of that. So we were dealing with all of that while we were growing a company from three employees to 100. And we had a 13-year-old girl in the house. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, told my, I told my daughter at one point, I said, you read Sherlock Holmes. You're Professor Moriarty. Your mom is Sherlock Holmes. She knows everything. <laughs> Quit trying to get away with it. <laughs> Dad. I'm like, all right, whatever. Uh, so yeah, it was really, it was. Um, my best friend Matt's wife is Mary's best friend. Um, it was, go ahead. Yeah, that's, that's a little bit further that's down. That's a little bit further yeah. down the road. Yeah. Do you want to start it Yeah, I right. just, as I was talking to Beth about being the wife in a business, um, really when the idea came to Genesis, it really was the three-legged stool of myself, John, and Matt Muller on the technology side. I mean, we, we birthed this idea in the car, really. Yeah. That's when it really came to fruition. And at that point, I would say that by far I had the most business experience in, in the group. John was teaching and, and Matt was, had been coding his whole life. She had the most successful business. <laughs> yeah, well, not yeah. the most business experience. Matt and I had some great failures. Mary yeah. did not, she was successful. But you guys didn't own any business. No, 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 no. I mean, I remember the first time I said, well, we need to do a strategic plan, which I wish I had somehow recorded when Jacob came on. Yeah. I was like, well, you know, I've done a hundred strategic plans, this is how it goes, and I had dots, and here's what we're going to do, and these guys were like, what, <laughs> what, you know, they just didn't have any of that mechanics. So at the beginning, in that sense, I felt a great deal of ownership of the company. Um, in, you know, I carried all our, our uh, files around in my car, and, you know, I laugh now when I think Power school owns us, but it started in a in a file thing that I got from Pier One because it looked good in the all back of, of my receipts, car. All, all the receipts, I would contracts. yell at them. You know, where'd you, where'd you guys take that receipt? Who went to Staples and didn't tell me? You know, that kind of stuff. So there was a great deal of emotional ownership in a, in addition to being part of it. Um, and I think the title of our talk is getting out of the way, and that's a difficult. Learning when that's a difficult transition for family-owned businesses. You know, so many businesses are, are family-owned, and you, your family can destroy a business or help it grow. Um, so we were definitely a family and friends business, which brings a lot of benefits and a lot of really painful choices. For those of you that were here yesterday, you heard John talk about where he almost had to fire his best friend, Matt. Well, in addition to that, as he said, I'm, I'm a realtor, Everybody who we hired in 
I, I sold them houses, or I had sold them houses before. I that's knew why them. we hired them. I knew because them they were like, "That's a really good person." I knew Let's them on a very them. different level, and had this existing relationship. And I remember when uh, the woman who he hired in as our first VP of technology came from North Carolina. She was a single woman. I mean, we became good friends, and then he did fire her. I mean, that's a very painful thing to go through because at that point. You know, he was, we were in full business mode then. We had enough, it wasn't just, you know, oh, hey, this isn't working out. It was, that was painful. And painful for me on a personal level to trust him to make that decision, to realize that it, he was the CEO. And although she and I had just spent a week together at the beach sharing, you know, life stories and friendships and that kind of thing, that's difficult. I feel this is like a play, so all of this played out. So for my end, it was her trusting me. I think every relationship, now whether I'm right or wrong, maybe it's my own, I think every man in the world just wants to be respected. And I think every woman wants to be adored. That has nothing to do with your success in business. That has nothing to do with your success as an employee. I just wanted to be respected. And here was this poor kid who had nothing, right? And I just wanted my wife to say, man, I trust you. Go, you know? And, and it wasn't, I would say, she never, she never just said, hey, I'm not trusting you. But what would happen with us, the way we communicated with each other, mo many times, I would say probably after we started to gain some success. So literally in the beginning, I mean, it's whether we lose the money we borrowed or not, I think we all accepted that. But then when we really started to gain success, and we were growing very fast. So I mean, our growth rate was 100,000, 800,000, 1.6 million. Three, and this is during a recession. We were just cranking it. And so as it got, became that, our roles all started to change. And it became very painful. And it became painful in the house. We're gonna be very honest with you guys because we hope we don't, you don't make some of the uh, mistakes. Like I said, the only thing I, we can't do is tell you how much we sold the company for. We can't do that. Beyond that, we can answer or tell you pretty much any question because we want you to learn from our successes and from our failures. Nobody did that for us. Um, we had to painfully find out what some of those were. So. Well, and my strength in, in business has always been uh, connection. Um, I think a lot of women are better at intuition and connection, quite frankly, than, than men are. Um, and so what happened when the company was still relatively small, and I wasn't there on a daily basis, but these were my friends working here. You know, I, I would pop in at any point. I was sort of the... Uh, I'd the, say three to 30 employees. Yeah, three I Three to growing to 30 I was employees. the ringmaster of our, of our culture, and it wasn't because it was a strategy. It was just, we were... We, were we didn't have time to... We, well, did, we, we didn't have time to well, own the culture. And we, we, were like, were, we were fun people. So, you know, we did Flash Fun Fridays. I'd send out an email on Wednesday, let's everybody meet here, we're going to have drinks, you know, 5 o'clock, people show up. And it was just, just fun. But... Um, we took everybody on a cruise and their spouses... Uh, if we broke we, when we first broke a million in sales, and that was her. She, she had this. I'm just gonna say this genius on travel. We took everybody. Took 17 people. Well, we took 17 people on a cruise, spouses, all of those things, uh, with, and we became really close. And just for the record, on that cruise, everybody got fired except for one person. So eventually we had to fire all of those so close people, or two, two of them, right? <laughs> Chris, yeah. This is what we lived with. It, it, it was, it's, it's painful, it's a fun ride, but it's really painful. But when I was still, as I said, in the, in the office on a very regular basis, and we were growing the company, and these were friends, what happened regularly, and what's interesting is the brokerage I own now, I'm the only woman in the partnership, and the same thing happens between me and our general manager, people come to me. That's who comes to me. They don't go to him. They don't go to my partner now to say, you know, there's really a problem down in the lower office. You know, these people, they come to me because I connect, I listen, I'm safe space. And it, it got bad. Like the girls would want to go out for drinks and I'd go out with them and they would blow my ears up about what John didn't know. And John doesn't listen. Our clients are doing this. It's a real problem. And they're so, we just won't listen. Now, coming home, I would walk through the door 
And my wife would say, you're just not listening. And I would go, what yeah. the heck are you talking about? Well, I just had drinks with her. I had dinner with her. I had lunch with this employee, this employee, this employee. And you need to know really what's happening. And, I, and my reaction was, you're not there yeah. every day. And this is what we just start going. And we would just, and it would just start building up. And so that's kind of, we're kind of getting you through the, like probably year three through three and four. And that's when Mary started to, it, it all came to a real hold. We had a great culture. Mm -hmm. So we had a culture that was very giving. We, we, had, we hadn't defined our values of hug, being honorable and selfish and generous yet. But we volunteered in the schools. We gave back to our community. Mary had so many volunteer opportunities set up for the employees. They loved doing it. We had uh, more um, Flash Run Fridays. March Madness was just out of control. You weren't allowed to work in our place from 12 to 5 on Thursday and Friday. We bought TVs and put them in every room, and we made you watch basketball. And it was awesome. And, the, and, then, and then she came up with the idea, everybody put a sheet in, and the person that won, we sent them and their spouse on a four-day destination unknown. They had no idea where they were going. They got 13 letters. They'd open up the first letter and say, go to the Roanoke Airport, put your credit card in. When you land, open up the second envelope. And they did that for four days. <laughs> they had no idea what they were doing. We would do things, that, we would just do crazy things like that. And, and Mary would spearhead that whole thing up to about 30 employees. And that's when, and that's when that's it really when, That's when it really started changing for me. Um, and that's, you know, I would say probably Matt's pivoting was the most painful but for me, I was the first. I was the first one who had to get out of the way, and um, it was it was painful. True. Still is. He's writing a book now, and we're going through some of the chapters, and I can remember how it felt to me when we were at that stage and what happened. I remember one of the very first ones. It reminds me how it felt, by the way. No, I'm just I did not. Out. What um, one of the most <laughs> difficult things is that that um, giving back to the community. That's been my passion for life. It still is. I believe as a company, you know, you, you, you should give back, you've got to get engaged. And so we had all these wonderful projects that we did as a group. And uh, we were just starting to figure out, oh, there's divisions here and titles and this kind of thing. And I had a meeting of my folks that always helped me put these things on. And somebody went to his office and complained and was like, why do we have to pack backpacks? And I can tell you, I internally was not gracious at all. Internally, I was like, because we own the company and this is what we it's do. exactly what it was. You know, she was uh, like, because we're an owner really? and you're going to do that. You know, you're 24 years old and you're telling me you don't want to pack backpacks for needy kids and we're an educational software company? Work me through this, you know. But I didn't. I had to go, oh, all right, so now we have to get opinions about these things. And that's that was a difficult transition. At that same time as when we uh, moved into our, our big building, so to speak, that really gave us a presence in the community. I mean, we went from um, a, a back bedroom that Matt had to... Basement of one of our rentals. Yeah, yeah, where all the neighbors wrote letters to we got to like the, seven violations for having a business. Yeah, it was, in a, it was, yeah, and that was bad. <laughs> well, she would be like, I'm on the board of this. You cannot do this. I'm like, all right. <laughs> yeah, because the neighbors figured out in a hurry that in the morning six cars came in. <laughs> People worked all day. The, and then at five o'clock, six cars left. left, you know. Um, from there to a strip mall in the rough side of town where we thought we had... 300 bucks a month for 1,400 square feet. Take that all day, people. We thought we had really arrived. And then to this big building that we rehabbed and got all sor sorts of attention for doing it. And I was very much at the front end of that. Um, and I think when we, we got in the uh, building is when it was it most It just difficult. started to hit the... Guys come into my office. Why do I have to have this color? Why can't I just do what I want to do by my desk? Your your wife <laughs> is telling me I have to have this, and I look up and go, Yeah, you know, like we're majority owners of this company, mm -hmm. right? I'm just I'm just saying that. I mean, just for the record, you know, and and my employees would throw it back in my face. They would say to me, Well, you say there's no owners in the business. The owners don't run the day to day. The owners. Like, if I would have fired Matt, my best friend, he still owned his shares. I can't fire him from his shares. So we had, this is where we really started to have to figure out, I have this position, a paid position in the company, and I have shares. Those are two totally different things. They are not the same thing. And that's when we started to really go 
because she really didn't have a position in the company. The only thing she could fall back on is she cared deeply, as deeply as I did about our company. Mm -hmm. She cared about the, the employees. She cared about just as much as I did. I didn't see that, and she didn't, you know. So her fight back is, I'm an owner, because that's all she had. She didn't get to grasp that, and I would go, well, I'm the CEO. And that's just the way, you know, I, I have to make this decision. And so. And as he grew as a CEO, um, I began to understand that for me, as a strong personality and as a businesswoman, I was going to have to figure out what I did with this thing. And that was the point that I realized, I think we really have something here. By continuing my role in the way it's been, it's going to be more difficult, it's going to hamper him, and it's unpleasant for me. I don't like having people tell me that things are going wrong at the company um, when I can't fix it because I can't do anything but go home and tell him and then that goes down. So my stepping away or stepping to the side involved going back to what I knew best and some of that was just coincidentally I was already going to be state president and I was on the road 2013 the entire year essentially away from the business. I mean we and the 13-year-old just moved in. Yeah. My ex-wife, uh, she, well, she, she went home and said, I, wanna, I want to uh, uh, live with you guys my, for high school, and she did. And so I'm just saying from, from my wife's perspective, here I am on the road, right? Mm -hmm. And here's this it was a teenager in the just dropped in that we didn't raise, and we didn't. We didn't raise her. You know, she came in the summers, and, and that was the relationship. And the, comp the and company was, was growing a lot at that oh, time. Crazy, so, crazy growth. And my other company is growing. So it was, it was a lot of stuff at, at one time. But, you know, in doing now studies of other companies and help me, helping other companies, I think the reason it was important for me to be part of this discussion is there are a lot of strong family members who you may or may not have involved. Um, and that's challenging, and realizing their strengths, but also hopefully that they will recognize where they can sometimes be hindrances. And you're, like you said in the last session, your thing is to get people excited to see the big picture. Once I could see the big picture of where interactive achievement was going, I realized it wasn't necessarily about my personal ownership of our culture, or Flash Fun Fridays, or things like that. It had nothing to do with value. It was. It was the. It was deeper than that. It, it was a deeper thing. That but we it was easier for me to pivot. Now it's, it's never easy uh, to pivot. No, the the hardest <laughs> the hardest time for me in the life of the company was the day we sold the company. Oh. Man. And it was. Crushed. It was one of the easiest for him. Greatest moment ever. <laughs> and he will tell you this over and over and over. And I can tell you at that point, um, Jacob Gibson was married to Kim Gibson, who had worked for Interactive Achievement, but was then, she was no longer working before the company sold. Um, Becca Muller, who was Matt, became Matt Muller's wife during the growth of the company. And again, that those times where you think, wonder if, I mean, everybody in the room has had a really good friend who either married or dated a schmuck. And I, Matt had a history of dating really, I'll say it, kind of trashy girls. And when he brought back She used to come, wait, she used to come home and go, what if he marries somebody like, what if he, what if, what if we have to do all these things with, what if something happens to Matt and that person has to take over, well, you know, or that person she has, would go through this whole thing. The person had ownership. And like, when, they just went on one date, honey. Just, yeah, just, just, <laughs> when, when Matt would, um, when Matt met Becca and she and I became close, then she and I had to navigate Matt telling her there was a period of time during the part that he calls the pit of despair where the rewrite was terrible terrible and it wasn't going and our VP was getting fired and Matt was angry and so Becca would probe Matt at night about how the rewrite was going. I would probe him as to what was going on from the corner office and then Becca and I would kind of reassure each other or hold each other's hands because we were terrified that they were going to blow stuff up. But um, you know during during that time these the, the wives when we were ready to sell the company, we were all terrified. We were terrified because we all had relationships in that building and people didn't know it was coming. 
because that was part of the process. And um, he was like, it's going to be great. My goal in life is to take care of my wife, <laughs> and that is now complete. No, it's not. Not completed. Not even still, close. Not close. Well, not it's even. somewhat completed no. in my mind. I'm like, no. done. No finish line. No finish. There's no checkbox on no. that. But, no. but for me, it was the relief of literally. I mean, we can. We 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 are we are afforded the right to do whatever we want to do in life now, and that's not. People don't get to say that. That's not normal. You know, we're talking about people who've. Scrimped and scraped at times. When work, I've worked three jobs one time. Three jobs. I was getting two hours of sleep a night. I had to go through that for six months to survive. I don't have to do that again, right? So for me, that's how I looked at it. So you can see this huge dichotomy, even right at the end of, uh, I mean, the, the women got together that day and we, we cried together because we knew <laughs> how different the culture was going to be at the new company. And we knew that people didn't see this coming, would feel betrayed. And these were people, some of them that, you know, I had known longer than you knew them because they were my clients who were then working at the company. And, you know, I had outside relationships with them. So that was a very difficult process that still, I mean, we're sort of on different sides of the fence on that. That John's relieved and... Well, I, you know, it was... So let's just walk through it. Let's go back and talk about stepping aside. So she kind of took you to the end, but stepping aside, Mary, Mary it was when, my, when the employees started coming to me saying, why is this person in a sense helicoptering in, telling us we have to do these things, and then going out, and she doesn't even work here. And we're the ones that should be leading this, is what we kind of were getting to. And like she said, she was going to be the president. It really led us to, and, this, and I'll tell you, the two of us ended up in counseling. And it was really hard for me because I, I came in and sat down with our pastor, and she's basically sitting there saying what an asshole I am when I come home and, and I don't listen. And it, it, it's, it's, she, all she wants to do is understand. She's not trying to tell me what to do. You know, I'm sitting here listening to this, and I'm not joking. I have this epiphany. I'm like, where am I? We are growing at like 50% in the company. I love my wife dearly. I'm like she's the first person relationship that I actually like her. Not just love her. I like being, and if those of you who are older have had some marriages, I actually like being with my wife. I like that. <laughs> That's not always true, people, you know. <laughs> I think my mother and father married lovely 43 years, but she made him go back to work after he retired. I thought, why did she do that? But well, anyway. I'm, I'm working on that, too. Yeah, she's, <laughs> <laughs> I like her. <laughs> So we're sitting there with our pastor, and, and she just kept saying, I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. I literally wrote up my resignation to the board of directors um, probably uh, about four years ago. I had it on my computer. I was going to resign because I wasn't going to let this company ruin my marriage. And I came home, and she's like, are you kidding? You're going to put that on me? You know, that's how I, I was like, whoa, whoa, okay, I'm lost. You know, anyway. We had to work through that. It isn't easy. I'm not going to sit up here and tell you it was hard. And this was the one person in my life who, who did respect me, one person in my life who trusted me. And, and uh, we, we really went through some really crushing times. She, we talk about friends. Uh, there's, we have family and friends who won't speak to me any longer. I get blamed for everything. No one ever says, it's really funny, no one ever says, hey, were they a really crappy employee? No, you're a terrible person for firing them, you know? <laughs> like, like, like I woke up this morning and I said, you know what? I'm going to fire that guy I've known for 27 years. Yeah, that bastard. He's gone. <laughs> like, I did that, you know? It's almost like th there's no responsibility on the other party. And it's not like I'm going to go out and defend myself because that's not, I can't do that. Legally, I can't. There's so many different reasons why I can't do that. But we have family and friends who don't talk to us. She's had clients, well, uh, and to, everything. Well, you know, again, to Roanoke is a, a community of similar size, and I would say relationship-wise as Missoula. So you don't just know those people. You know those people. I mean, my hairstylist fired me because he fired her husband. <laughs> I'm like, oh. Women, and her daughter and our daughter have been best friends since they were five. Yeah. So it's that sort yeah. of intertwining that... Um, those those are the things that I think I've watched other companies perhaps navigate not so 
well and figure figure out you know wow that's really a mess so that that so you stepped aside with the culture and it really it really started to, it took on a whole different flavor but and I, and this is what I try to explain to the employees things will not stay the same so when we were 17 employees all in one room I'll tell you the biggest shifts was being in one room you hear everything you hear the salespeople selling you hear the technology guys bitching about code and what's going on there you hear the support people greatest line ever in that room was our support the the, the uh, veterinarian uh, tech <laughs> standing up and going did we push out a new part of the product and the developers went yeah they're like uh, can you tell us because we have to support it they had no idea it went out and all these calls started coming in and like what is that they didn't even know it was in the product and that's you know but in the but in the room we could answer that like that but when you get into a 10,000 square foot building, it doesn't work that way, right? And so we had to adjust, you know, what was our culture gonna be? Culture to me was never nap pods and bat poles and culture to me was being honorable, unselfish and generous and we could do that anywhere. That was our culture. Now, having a bacon off, we threw 32 pounds of bacon in from around the world uh, to see what's the greatest bacon. We did March Madness, we did crazy things. That wasn't our culture. Our culture was we hired and had honorable and selfish and generous people. And Mary built that foundation of what that was. We didn't call it that at the time. And she had to step away from that. And so, um, that so we started a foundation from the company, um, which I chaired. So it kind of gave me a standalone, different way to affect. And it was, you know, working with kids. Um, so, you know, we, we found ways to do that where it wasn't quite so uh, harmful to the internal workings of the office and not so stressful for me because and that was stressful. Yes. Yeah. And then the next one to switch was Matt. Mm -hmm. And you know, he was, Matt, Matt was a guy. So Matt's toughest thing was communication. It just was. It was just um, he would scream in a sense. I used to say he used to scream and nobody would listen. And, and here's the thing. Matt was most likely right about most everything he would say. But the way he would say it, people just wouldn't listen. That's a little lesson for in the room. If people aren't listening to you, it's irrelevant whether you're right or wrong. It just is. So it came to a point where I had him in my office. Here's my best friend since we were 13. Um, and I had to fire him. I had to let him go. Because he was the biggest hurdle in the company. He was a cancer. He was, it was just terrible watching it. There was a guy who, uh, when I got divorced, I was a teacher. I had no money in the summer, wrote me a check out of his account for $2,500. So the first summer I could spend with my daughter because he didn't get to spend time with his dad. That was him. And I had to call him in my office to fire him. Think about that. And um, God, thank God. I'm not joking when I say when I did that. Mary and Becca were buying Becca's wedding dress. At the same time I had Matt in my office, pinky swearing that they wouldn't let us screw up our lives. That the two of them would stay together no matter whether Matt and I did or not. And that's how hard it gets, right? And uh, Matt looked at me and just said, people really think I'm an asshole. <laughs> I said, well, yeah, I'm not making that up. And he said, would you give me a chance to learn what grace is and to, to do that? And this is, this is one of the rarest things, I'm going to tell you this. And he literally changed how he approached things. Yeah, Matt got, Matt got out of the way next. And I, when I say his was probably more painful than mine, I mean, he wrote the entire program. It was all... It was, it was his baby <laughs> for all these kids using yeah. this, for all the accolades for the program, for all of this. And we had to this. rewrite it. Yeah. But it was, that was Matt's baby. So to get out of the way and to hire in a boss over him, which is what you had to do, yep. that's, that's tough. I mean, I got people who wouldn't listen to me or thought I was the plant waterer when I'd walk in. But he had to essentially start <clears throat> reporting to someone who hadn't written the product, wasn't part of the beginning. And he didn't wasn't, trust. And he didn't trust because he didn't think they knew what they were doing. So I think Matt's getting out of the way was more painful than mine. It was, it, what's really interesting thank god he did because he was such a savant um i can't tell you how brilliant of a programmer this guy was um not having him the last three or four years would have 
would have really brought the value of our company down. It just would have. Matt did things, just to give you one example of Matt. Um, uh, we had, um, the, the way we had to do, so we had to go up and copy, you guys all know what standards are. I mean, Montana has their standards. Think about having standards for 50 states and trying to get that into your product. Well, we'd have to go up and copy the thousands of standards in one state for K through 12, co copy, paste into our product. He comes down one day and he says, I want to talk to you about Becca, his wife. He goes, I want to talk to you. And I said, why can't Matt? And now here I was. They'd come get me because I was just like a machine on copy, paste, and, you know. <laughs> and uh, I said, Matt, I can't. This is like uh, three years ago. And I'm like, Matt, I can't do it. I, I got to copy and paste this. And he's like, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm copying and pasting standards, and th I, I need to get this done, Matt. Where's that at? I said, well, is that, on, is, that, is that up online on this? I said, yeah. Okay. Comes back 45 minutes later. He goes, refresh the product. And I said, I refreshed the product. All the standards were in there, completely formatted exactly the way they should be. We went to our programming team, and they told us it would take three months and three programmers to do it. He did it in 45 minutes so he could talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> You guys have no idea how brilliant this guy was. Now, there's a flip side of that brilliance, too. But thank God, he really humbled himself to step aside. And then the, the, Jacob always step us, he, Jacob was always moving to whatever we needed Jacob. He was, Jacob, his greatest quality was being honorable. Gosh, he was just, just the Eagle know, Scout. I think Hire the, any Eagle Scout you can, by the way. The, the, point, the point, my viewpoint on this is, you know, there's all the stuff you would learn in business school about running a business. There's all the things you can read in business books. But we're humans, <laughs> and these are human commodities and relationships that can destroy a business or help it grow, depending how you interact with people and, you know, how. Once, once you stepped aside, Mary became my greatest mentor. And I say that because she, had, she knew me so well. Because I would be, I know this might surprise you, I'd be emotionally over the top. I would go, this is all over. She'd go, stop it. Stop, take a breath. But once you stepped aside, then she, she actually took a different role. Um, all the way through taking an investment, through... Um, uh, helping get our board members. Getting the doing, board members. Yeah. Uh, uh, helping me on running on running a board meeting. I never ran a board meeting in my life. And she's like, you need to do, you know, Robert's rules. I'm like, who? Robert who? And why does he have rules? Why would you have rules in a meeting? That's stupid. You know, she's like, oh, okay, no. Mm -hmm. you're, you're like, you're dealing with like, like top level people here. You, you know, so we, we really shifted our relationship. And then for me, it was when I brought uh, Tom and Marcy in. Tom was my CFO this last two years. And like I said, the, Tom was a six to 60 million guy. Marcy was the three to 30 million. Um, uh, Marcy came in as our VP of marketing. And when we went to hire her, we all realized she was like more than that. And so within like three months, I'm like, you know, you ever think about, about being a chief operating officer? She's like, well, I've always thought about being a chief marketing officer. I said, I know, like, man, you have a gift. And so within three months, she was our chief operating officer. And when I had the two of them, that's when I had to step back and go, it's time for me to step aside. Yeah, he was, he was the last one was to have to kind of get out of the way and realize that. Realize I was becoming the hurdle for top people. So when you go out and invest, it was really hard, oh my God, to spend the money to hire them. It was so hard. And uh, when we did it, uh, I can't tell you how awesome that was that we did do that. I realized very quickly, my executive coach, uh, he told me, he says, you're, now, you're, not playing varsity, you're not playing high school varsity football anymore. You're not playing, the, you skipped college. You, you went to the pros with these guys. You gotta step up your game. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, they're, they're, these, these guys aren't here to play a little drama politics that some of your people can play. They're here to, to win. They're here to grow the value of the company. They're here to make this a better place. And he goes, and you cannot be in their way. And I was like, well, what do you mean? And he's like, you can't be in their way. You have to trust them, you have to empower them, hold them accountable, and let them do their job. So all the way to the point where nobody asked me for a raise any longer. I never did an interview ever again. Um, uh, they always went to Tom. They would come, it was really funny now. So they would come to my office and they would go, I gotta go ask Tom if I can give this guy a raise. How do I do that? I'm like, well, what do you think Tom's gonna say? He's gonna say I have to fire somebody to give somebody, to hire and give somebody a raise. I said, yeah. 
<laughs> so what are you gonna do? <laughs> Well, I guess I could let this person go because they really haven't done any work in a year. I'm like, you you have a guy who hasn't done work in a year? And you're letting him be here? What's wrong with you? So we have those conversations. Marcy, uh, just so brilliant. She pushed me to have top level women because women bring such a different perspective. Statistically, companies that have women on boards or in leadership do better than companies that don't. You know? And so I had all men at, at, and and then within about a year I had I was 50 50 both women and men and it was really great to hear the just the different ways of doing things but Marcy and Tom my last vacations the last couple of years uh, they I never got an email never got a phone call I remember you were in Ireland and you looked at me and you're like I haven't even checked your email in like three days I'm like I know this is like awesome I like it that I because once again I like her so this was fun you know and so um, Marcy l l ran the day-to-day -day. I mean the everything there was <laughs> she's ran it and Tom oversaw the financial and they were both big strategic thinkers and so um, that was when we like I said we once I got out of the way so my gift they all realized they they came they used to call it let's let, let John Hagmar be John Hagmar so I wrote a letter to all of our clients and I said I have basically I have time now because I got smart people uh, I can come and visit you if your team would like to sit and talk with me and uh, what 75 of our clients 75 we had a hundred and some clients 75 said absolutely I put 9,000 miles on my truck in six weeks I had the greatest Spotify album you can ever have, by the way, <laughs> for all you 70s and 80s junkies. I had a great one. Yeah. Anyway, um, and I would drive out and I would sit down and it was, and it, I would get in a room, as you could tell, and I would just get all jazzed up with them. But every room I walked into, they would say, can I just tell you something? I was like, what? What are you not telling me? Your customer support staff is the greatest staff we've ever seen. Now here are the seven things you need to fix. I'm like, all right. <laughs> and we did that in every, every meeting. And finally I'm driving home and I called our, uh, the bagel, bagel guy. <laughs> called the bagel guy, who was my customer service director. I said, put me on speakerphone. We had, uh, I think, 12 staff down there. I said, this is the 37th meeting I've walked into and the first thing everybody says is how awesome <laughs> you guys are. And I started naming names of the people that they were telling me. And I said, CJ, could you just do me one big favor? And he said, what's that? I said, can you just give, go down, get Debbie, get a $100 bill for everybody just for today, and I want you all to take your spouses out, significant others, celebrate just being awesome people. And that's what we could do in a culture like that, right? And I couldn't do that if I didn't go out and learn what our people did. So it was six hours driving across Virginia. I know that here that's like, you know, normal. <laughs> but that's, for that you're going, and I went all the way out to the, what they call the Eastern Shore out there by south of DC. And we're in Southwest Virginia. And I went all the way out there and I was driving down 54 and I called our accounts manager. I said, put all the accounts people on speaker. I said, thank you. And they said, for what? I said, I'm driving down Highway 52. <laughs> There's nothing here, man. And you guys do this every day. Thanks. And I started to learn what our people really did. And that really helped our company, helped our employees. But I couldn't do any of that if it wasn't for Tom and Marcy. Tom and Marcy, they, and then I got out of the way, all the way to the point, <clears throat> and we'll probably start taking questions here, but all the way to the point. So in uh, July of 15, I went to my board of directors and I asked for a 25% per, uh, percent pay cut. And um, uh, because if we didn't sell the company, I was gonna take Memorial Day to Labor Day off, and Tom and Marcy were gonna run the company while I was gone. And then they needed me in the fall to, to play golf with superintendent. I was, I was dead, this, this is, whether, whether people think it's whatever, that was my role in the company now. To go, I was, I'm a six handicap, I go play golf with the super, they love me playing in tournaments with them. Uh, I, would, I would go meet with them, I'd go to conferences, uh, just to hang out, take out, take out people to dinner. They need me to do that in the fall and in the spring. They didn't need me to do that in the summer or anything like that. And so I, I went to the board of directors and I asked them to, in a sense, deduct my salary and Marcy and Tom would run the company and eventually Marcy would take over the company and run it. Was, we had that succession plan in. So that kind of tells you our story. We sold the company. It's been a struggle for a year. I'm not going to tell you any different. It's been a hard adjustment for yeah, us. Yeah, because so. 
I still own a company. Did I mention that? I do not. <laughs> and so he's like, what well, are you I'll doing today? You. And I'm like, you know, kind of like what I was doing. Yeah, last. but I make her breakfast in the he morning. He does. He does. It's, it's a lot. I get her paper. But you know what's the, just for the, everybody here who has a business is sort of on a different trajectory. You may be saying, you know, we're this great Missoula company and so this is what we want to be. We're not going to try and sell or whatever. Or you might be saying we want to really take it big. Well, the story here happens at such lightning fast oh speed gosh. for us from the back bedroom to sitting here in Missoula together talking about this that those pivots have to happen very quickly. Mm -hmm. So I think you know your, your EQ in your business, your emotional intelligence, those relationships, knowing yourself and having tough conversations not only with your spouse if they're your business partner but with yourself that says, you know, what, what's the big picture here? Yeah. Is getting out of the way a bigger thing and taking my strengths to another arena that isn't sort of eroding at this? Is that the best thing to do? And I think that those are conversations and things you decide no matter where you are in the business trajectory. But EQ is every bit as important as IQ and um, I'd say makes businesses just as successful or as unsuccessful if you, if you don't have it. Well, so, so definitely work yeah. on that. And nothing great, <clears throat> nothing ever, great ever came from you. Right? It always came from us. That's a fact. It just did. There's nothing great you just did on your own. You did it with others. And I, my, my advice is learn how to communicate in a very non-passive aggressive way in a very <laughs> she actually tattooed that on me one day I had to get it removed <laughs> uh, but I would tell you how to learn, learn how to communicate in a way that's very healthy that puts you in an arena where honesty is on the forefront and pride and ego are not even in the realm it is just being honest and it's not a one-up situation let me one-up you well you're gonna say that to me let me say that to you uh, being, being able to self-reflect on yourself and being able to s talk honestly with, you know, um, all the way to the point. And this is, this is years of hardship, I would say. Last, yesterday, I, I always worry if I, I, I really do, I, I want to do a good job, you know, when I'm speaking or then. She got done and, and she, when we got done, we walked and we were walking out. She said, hey, that was a really good speech. And I was like, yes! 14 years later, she said it. She finally said it. Because you know? always, she's always like, it could have been, sh been shorter. Been short, you said, yeah. um, too much. Yeah, you, know? yeah. <laughs> you said, you know. And, uh, so, so anyway, I was like, I almost like fell down to a knee. I, I literally heard angels going, oh, <laughs> awesome. So uh, anyway, so that, we'll start asking some questions. I mean, that, that was, um, uh, that's kind of us in a nutshell. Uh, really is. Um, so. Yes. Um, how, how did you put together a board? You know, it's a great thing. So going back to Matt, when that was in that room, we had no board of directors. I had the, what we called the three wise men, the mentors. I had three people I was meeting for lunch. Um, uh, the whole thing was sitting down and kind of putting everybody on equal ground. So we decided to put a board in place who could fire me, and they would approve the budget and then advise me. And we all agreed the three the three wise men should be on. Mary, which I gotta tell you, when she said this, I was like, we are a technology company, honey. One of her real realtor friends was a very successful businesswoman. She's like, you totally need Janie. And I'm like, she's a realtor. I mean, what is she gonna help me in technology? One of the most brilliant business women, business persons I've ever met in my life. So she said her. And then uh, the other thing we all agreed, we wanted to have somebody in the education realm. So we had a, a, a retired, very well-respected director of instruction. So we kind of, we all sat around and did that. Matt voted yes on it just because he really thought that they were just going to fire me. He'll tell you that. That's, that's really true. That's a true story. Yeah, he, Matt was like, he was so they're going to see how evil you are, how terrible you are. You know, Didn't they? Am I right or wrong? Yep. And, and, and we were... <laughs> So, so getting, we wanted to have a unanimous vote on it, so that was easy to get that. Um, and then we put the board together, which was good because we, because when we went to go take an investment, we already had a board, and I really used them. Pay that? Yeah. So what we did at the time, which eventually became our stock option pool, uh, they got paid stock options. Very. In fact, 
I'll tell you how brilliant my board members were. They said, you will never give us stock options more than you would give your, in a sense, lowest employee. So don't sit there and say, you know, you're going to end up with 1% of the, you know, we're going to get very minimal. We never want to get more than a regular employee would get. And I was like, wow, okay. You talk about learning lessons now that when I'm out there in the real world <laughs> trying to help businesses, you learn those lessons. So I, we had stock options. And if we had to travel, we would pay for the travel. Um, um, uh, in fact, in the end, just to let you all know, we had 94 employees, 84 had stock options. And the most appreciative ones, and we had, we had, we had some that were life-changing stock options for people. Uh, uh, we had support reps who had uh, a very small amount of stock options. Got, I mean, a pretty good chunk of money. I mean, pretty good. I mean, but they wrote the nicest emails to me uh, at the end. They, they were the nice. The people that got the least wrote me the kindest emails. So the board had options. We had options. There's so many ways to do it. Uh, there's phantom shares. We converted phantom shares once we took an investment to stock options. Um, I, I would tell you all to have some form. That's a great way to do things because if they leave the company, they don't take the stock options with them. Most likely, they're not vested. It took three three years of fifty percent of your options, six years. So it's a good way to, to keep people bought in. And when we sold the company, everybody was vested immediately. That was in the that was in the dock. So everybody got all of their stock options on the day we sold. And so it was just really, uh, it was, that, that was a good way of doing it, so. And, and yes. First of all, I want to, I really appreciate your story. Uh, I don't own the business that I work for now, but for 12 years I did, and, and, and our story was almost identical. Yeah. I mean, you said she would tell you, and you said, you hey, know, <laughs> I almost burst out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to the point in meetings where, you know, I would stop and say, shit, I said <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. Um, right. Question I have for you: It sounds, you know, what in in your getting to the point where you needed to get out of the way, mm -hmm. it's like you realized it more, or were somehow brought to a point where you know you understood it or realized it by the close people around you, your wife. What have you seen, or what would you, you know, if you've got some an owner that or owners, uh, family, like right. religion, that are maybe not going to come to that realization and right. maybe are in the way right. and need to, you know, how, do you, how would you address that? What have you seen? What have you heard? You know, I've seen a lot of, in the last year, um, we've looked at investing into, I think, 65 businesses and we invested into one, just to let you know how that works. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, it's not an easy thing to, people, it's not an easy thing to get money. Um, um, here, here's what I would say, what I see a lot of, so for all of you who are owners in here, I would say, here, here was my problem, I didn't trust anybody. And so nobody else could do what I was doing because I didn't trust them. In fact, I started doing their job. It was so funny, I'd hire people, pay them great salaries and didn't do their job for them, which is the stupidest thing in the world. It was a waste of money. Um, talk about throwing away money. Uh, when I had Tom and Marcy, man, I, I, I just would, I trusted them with everything. In fact, great, really just a quick, how much I trusted them, uh, was uh, when we ended, uh, I came home to Mary, we're about to close in two weeks, close the, the deal, and I said, hey, they're gonna fire Tom. <laughs> I said it really excitingly, our CFO, because they have a CFO, they don't need a CFO, and nothing to do with, they just, didn't. I said, let's hire him as our like, CFO, and she's like, for what? And I'm like, I don't know, but just, he's smart. Let's, <laughs> let's not lose smart people. And she's like, you're right, he is smart. And he kind of keeps you in line a little bit. So this will really work. And so, you know, I mean, all the way to the point we trust him so much, Tom is the CFO of all of our business adventures now, <clears throat> that we do now. And he's also part of it. He's invested with us. So um, I would say most founders, families, they don't put people in place and empower them and trust them. That's what I've seen. And until you do that, then you have this realization. I was on this... I was on this lesson of pride and ego leaving my life for 14 years. It started when I went to Mary Hurst, true story. I flew back to Arizona to take my daughter back and we were getting married in two or two or three months. Saw my ex-wife and I apologized to her for everything. And she's like, are you trying to get back together with me? And I'm like, no. <laughs> I said, but I'm about to marry a woman that I, I think I really do love her for the first time, all these failed whatevers. 
And don't get me wrong, I, we could sit here and I could tell you all the things you did wrong, but I don't care because it's about what I did wrong and I don't want to do it again. And from that point, I literally started to take ego and pride and I wanted to get better. All the way to the point where I finally found Marcy and Tom, I was ready for them to say, come on in and do it. So, you know, um, I would say a lot of families grasp it. They don't want to let go of it. And they're going to lose, a, I've watched it, they lose a lot of really good employees. But that's a decision they have to make. Uh, to step aside, uh, <laughs> what kind of life do you want to live? That's another thing most of them don't, they can't see what that life would be. They haven't planned that. Like I've been planning what our life has been now for 14 years. It's been awesome. And, uh, but I've been doing that in my mind. This is what I want to do. I want to do this with my wife. And uh, a lot of people don't do that. So w what would this look like if Tom and Marcy took over your company right now? I don't know how many husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, whatever. If you had Tom and Marcy, what does your life look like? And if you can't do that, you're not, whether you trust him, you're not going to let it go because you want to wake up with purpose every day, right? And so I would say that. It was easier for him. Um, so I think for <laughs> yes. those concrete steps for people who, you know, just are like, whoa, uh, we had a good executive coach, I think. Oh, who, yeah, Jeff who, Smith was phenomenal. Who would help people be able to say, you know, you could destroy this by how you're acting, you owner, whatever. Um, but I, I, it, is, it is difficult because for a lot of people, John doesn't have this problem. I probably have it more what you're creating, what you're doing, sort of becomes your identity. And therefore, it's not scary because you're selling a company. It's scary because I used to tell people that was our baby we just sold. I mean, literally, it felt like, you know, get them to 10 years old and you're like, see ya, have a nice life. I hope those next parents are nice to you. That's what it felt like to me. So it is difficult. It's not just simple. Mine was the problem child is gone now. All right? <laughs> yeah. Summer, yeah. Summer camp. They're never coming back. Yeah. Summer camp forever. Yeah. Thank so, you. So it's very different, but, um, but it is hard, and I think not everybody recognizes it. It took each of us owners, I think, different spaces and times, yep. um, and actually Jacob stayed on. He did. Of the four owners, one of them stayed on after the company sold. Mm -hmm. And how, and would, you how yeah. would you characterize how he feels about that now? It was hard. I mean, because, you know, here's what I would tell you just from a company standpoint from mm -hmm. what happened to our employees. So in <clears> the <throat> last two and a half years, we went from 54 employees to 94. Mm -hmm. And so here's how I would sum it up. The employees that were hired within the last two and a half years loved that we sold Power. There was so much opportunity for them. The 54 prior to them were like, are you effing kidding me? You just destroyed my life. What are you doing? And so we like, I like go to lunch with one person going, thank you. Thank you so much. And I go to lunch with another one going, my life is so terrible. And you've pretty much caused that. And so this is what we would do. Or if they were let go for whatever reason. I've tried to help so many people find jobs in our community. I mean, it's just been crazy. But uh, it, that's what I would tell you is we went through this whole watching. It's, don't sit there and think, well, we can never sell because the employees, they have to learn how to adjust, people. They just do. That's life. What would they do if the company went out of business? That's what I would ask them. What would you do? Because that could happen if we keep on going. You know, because these people are about buying us. If they don't buy us, we have to go to war against them, right? And I don't have a $500 million fund behind me. Oh, by the way, they do. So, you know, let's think it through, you know. And so, you know, a lot of employees adjusting. I mean, we're very corporate. They went to a very corporate mindset to, um, I guess we were not corporate, you know. Uh, <laughs> probably the opposite of corporate. So, and that was just part of it. Um, so... And you deal with that. We spent a year dealing with that, I would say. So, um, But now, I mean, I'm going to say this from my perspective. So she's traveling a lot for, for, for real estate um, uh, because she's uh, in, in AAR. So I get to go with her on all of those things. We People are shocked that I actually have a husband. I mean, yeah, for 10 years, they never saw me. Yeah, I'm like, like, hey, everybody. <laughs> Realtor people, I said that correctly. Thank you. <laughs> you know? So uh, anyway, uh, yeah, they were. They were like, you're Mary's husband. I'm like, yeah, you do one, you know? So really love doing, we're enjoying that. And, you know, we had our dreams. We, we sat down before. That was another thing we did. 
Um, we somewhat planned out what we wanted to do. Um, this, it was so interesting to me, too, because of how um, we both looked at what happened to us. Um, she was so afraid, you know, from, an, uh, from the perspective of, could we lose it all? And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't think we could spend all of this if we tried. Let's try to do that. <laughs> and so we had to, ba we really did. We really had to balance that up. Tom, I'll say, Tom, once again, our CFO, he's been a great help and that. We had we have a really good broker. We actually interviewed, we, we had a broker before that, but you know we went out and interviewed four brokers and as a family, we brought our, our daughter and son in, and <clears throat> and we did we went through all that process at, at the end for us. So there was just a, there's just a lot of adjustment that occurs. It's yeah, you know, you think, wow, when this happens, I've arrived. But I mean, how many times have you heard stories about people who, whether it's the lottery or whatever, just made really poor decisions? And with any big change, there's new challenges. And you know, I was pretty content with saying. All right, this happened. I still own this company. I'm going to work today, and you know, this one wasn't. And so we've had. It's taken us. It'll be a year. I was thinking about this this morning. It'll be a year in a couple of weeks. Yep, that, that we sold the company. So it's been a year-long journey for us to be. Yeah, yeah. Tough, you know, tough year. Yeah, it has been. We've had very tough. We we made we made some poor choices. Very poor choices. Yeah. But we didn't do it twice. Yeah. So I guess the biggest getting out of your own way was selling the company. <laughs> and how did that process come about? Were you looking to sell? Was it something that no. was by your investors, or was somebody nope. coming in saying you want to buy it? No. Nope. In fact, the investor was. We were very much on the same. The investor and I became uh, very close friends uh, throughout that process. Uh, we, had, we had a very honest relationship with each other. If you find the right investors, that's what we, we try to be. I would tell you, we try to be those right investors. Um, uh, so anyway, um, the way that kind of came about. Once again, I would tell you. The Inc. 500, 5,000, we were Virginia Small Business of the Year, all those things put us on the radar of investors, companies. And in the spring of 15, I started getting a lot of calls on, hey, are you guys ready to take your next financial investment? Just for the record, nothing burns cash more than growth. Nothing. You do not have enough cash if you are trying to grow. <laughs> Just telling you that. It just, that's a fact. Do not lie to yourself. You just can't do that. Now, how you go about that's a whole other thing. So I had a board of directors, we'll go back to that, with the investor who was on the board, and I said, I'm getting calls about not only investment, but possible, this is how they would say it, are you interested in the next investment or sale of the company? And so I said, there are three things that need to happen before we would even be ready to do either of those. One, we're up for a, a, a five-year, $20 million state contract with our second product, not even our first. I said, that, that really le that's a legit thing, getting outside of Virginia legitimately. And uh, the third thing was to be able to really uh, expand from an employee perspective, how, do, how does that scale, scale out? I'll know that in July. Well. The board said, if they're really serious, they're going to call you back in July. Well, I started getting all calls back in July. And we had, we had gotten the uh, state contract. We had, all those things came off. So I went to my board, and I said, what do you want me to do? And the investor, they said, why don't you and Matt Spetzler, why don't the two of you just kind of sit down with Mary, because the three of you really make the decision, um, and talk it through. And so that's how it started. And then the investor having him was just a blessing. Because he said we're going to hire an investment bank to do it, um, which was we hired Signal Hill out of uh, Baltimore, which is um, they were so awesome. And uh, so what they do is they they manage that process. It's a crazy process, people. It is. It was we did we had to drive to D.C. We didn't want to do meetings, manage meetings. So we had we basically just I don't know if you guys want me to take you through that or not. I don't want to waste your time. But do you want to go through? You want me to take you kind of through what that looks like? So we did it in a lightning time. Most people take about nine months. We did it in five. Once again, I'm just going to say this. I had Marcy and Tom. Awesome. I'll tell you a great story on that. So we went to the investment banker. We interviewed investment bankers, chose our law firm, mm and down in um, uh, Atlanta. They were, these guys were all top-notch groups. And um, what they eventually did for us was, uh, is that, are we almost done? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, 
what they what they basically took us through was you put a bit you, you put a sheet out that has your numbers that have your name people get an NDA and then they get a 60 page document you put together of your company and then they, they if they want to bid on your company they will and there's no number they don't they don't know they look at, they look at your numbers and they give you a bid and we had 16 bids yeah I know right you're going wow 16 and the range was incredible and so we did nine management meetings that's four hours of meeting with their whole team your whole team and um, we did that in DC so we had to drive back and forth that's a four-hour drive between Roanoke and DC and so we would drive back and forth we were just like we did that in four weeks by the way and then everybody puts their final bid after that and then you lock down your you negotiate your final bid and then normally you have 60 to 90 days to go through due diligence like they look at all your contracts they look at your they look at everything I mean they're they just they pick you apart we did ours in 30 actually so Mary and I we were actually in Paris uh, on uh, our anniversary is New Year's Eve and we pick a different place in the world and I actually closed the deal for the letter of intent with them in the Louvre with a bunch of tourists taking pictures over me it's hilarious on New Year's Eve day and um, in February 1 we, we closed and sold the company so it happened that like Mary said it was just like you blinked and all of a sudden wow wait a minute we hadn't even talked about selling the company before July, July August right and so yeah. by February the next year, we no longer owned a company. It happened that fast. It's, it's pretty, it was pretty sudden. I think we're at that out of time. Oh, are we out of, are we out of time? So. Is that it? Yep. Are we out? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any other questions before we jump? We can hang around. Yeah, people. we can hang around. You guys can email us. Uh, but here's what I can tell you in the end. This is a true statement. Right? In the end. I believe we made the right choice in the end, as, yeah. as painful sometimes as it was. And I would say that in this way was... We're off to doing what's next for us, right? It didn't end on February 1. It's what's next for us. And we're finding, we're finding that way together. It's been a lot of fun that, doing that, as we did when we first started the company. And, and uh, we're stronger, uh, better for it. And um, uh, we're really glad we got to tell you our story on that. So. At the end of the day, I think we made a good decision <clears throat> for the Roanoke Valley, which was important to me. I wanted our community to like. And our investors. <clears throat> you know, and just. Two, week, yeah, two weeks there. two weeks ago we had a front page article about Commonwealth and the company that we just invested in which is also in our group and when I can get big picture and not think about that poor employee who was crying over lunch you know the greater good we did a good thing for we our community and that was important to me so thank you all thank you <laughs>